it's August, believe it or not. August, the month when we say happy birthday to our Unity co-founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. They're the reason we're here this morning. One way or the other, each one of us found something in what they created that really speaks to us, and it has made a, a positive difference in the way that we live. And whatever that might be, whatever it is that might have brought us here, it all started in April of 1889 when Charles and Myrtle first published a magazine that they called Modern Thought. They were operating out of the living room of their home in Kansas City, Missouri. Charles was a self-educated real estate broker and Myrtle was a school teacher and a housewife. Um, here's a couple of pictures here of them in their earlier days. As you can see, Myrtle was the older woman. She was almost 10 years older than Charles. Born on August 6, 1845, and Charles on August 22, 1854. Now, Myrtle was raised in a religious family, but she refused to join her family's church because she couldn't accept the teachings of the mainline churches back in those days. That's important because it meant that she didn't have a lot of embedded theology that she had to get rid of, nothing to get in the way of the new ideas that eventually came through. And, and Charles wasn't much on religion either. Um, he had been raised on the frontier near an Indian reservation in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and that was before Minnesota became a state. He had no formal education, and church wasn't a priority, so like Myrtle, Charles hadn't been programmed the way so many other people were, open to new ideas. and. Uh, Probably the main reason that unity came to be was because Myrtle contracted tuberculosis. Now back in those days, TB had no cure. It would either spontaneously resolve on its own after you were placed someplace that had lots of circulating air and a dry atmosphere and whatever the other things were that they did. It either resolved on its own or it killed you. And uh, we have to remember what the practice of medicine was like back in those days. It was really in its infancy. It was pre-scientific. It was unregulated, which means that there were all sorts of, uh, oh, let's call them snake oil peddlers and quacks who went around and passed themselves off as doctors with all sorts of crazy, dubious things that they claimed would cure people. No antibiotics, no really effective anesthesia. All of that came into being um, after the turn of the century. If, if, if you had pain, you would take opiates, morphine, and things like that. Really, all that a, a doctor could do back in those days was to prescribe rest, make sure that you had a proper diet, make sure that you remained hydrated so that the body could essentially heal itself. And the results were not good. Up until the 20th century came around, less than half of all children lived to see their 21st birthday. It's pretty bad. So Myrtle was looking for a cure, and since the doctors couldn't be of much help, she had to take matters into her own hands. And she used what she called positive prayer and affirmations. She she thought of herself as teaching her body that it was not subject to the limitations of this disease, but that she was spiritually whole and strong. And it worked. The disease disappeared. She lived until 1931, 86 years old. Now today, we have successfully eradicated TB by uh, vaccines and antibiotics and other forms of prevention and treatment and we would probably call what what Myrtle did with her healing we probably call that the placebo effect or or the expectation effect um, but that's what she had to work with and so she worked it her personal mission after that became one of healing and helping and nurturing and teaching she was the she was the driving force behind uh, this organization that started out as the Society of Silent Help, which we all know today 
as Silent Unity, the Silent Unity Prayer Ministry, which was the first 24-7 prayer ministry in the world, and it's been continuously operating since back in the days of Myrtle Fillmore. Another one of her gifts to the world, and one that I don't think she gets enough credit for, was her work with children. Myrtle firmly believed that children were getting the wrong message about the nature of life and death from schools, which would teach basically the same religious message that churches taught in the day. So in 1893, she became the editor of a monthly magazine for children that she called We Wisdom. Some of you may have heard of that, might recall We Wisdom. 1896, she wrote a children's book called We Wisdom's Way. We Wisdom's Way. Say that real fast a few times. <laughs> now, th this was back in the days when children were supposed to be seen and not heard. Anybody ever get that message growing up? Little children should be seen and not heard, right? Back in the days when religious education for children consisted of feeding them stories about demons, devils, and hellfire, Myrtle was offering a positive alternative. God wasn't there to punish disobedient children. She taught them of their own spiritual and essential human worth. Okay, now Charles, Charles had some health problems too. When he was a boy, um, he dislocated his hip in an ice skating accident. And again, due to the lack of competent medical care, his hip socket was destroyed. He got in with some quack treatments and uh, they did more harm than good back then. So he had to wear a leg brace for most of his life. And uh, Charles always hoped that he would totally heal his leg. He never quite managed to do that. What he did do was he managed to live a full active and healthy life despite the fact that he had to wear this leg brace and it caused him some pain and discomfort but he still managed to work with that and it never slowed him down. He lived until he was 93 I believe. So Charles sat back and watched Myrtle beating tuberculosis and he decided to investigate. He decided to see what was going on with all of that and I think it's fair to say that he was what you would call a skeptic. You had to prove it. You had to give him evidence. Now, Charles had no interest in religion, as I said before, because all he could see when he looked at all the different religious systems out there in the world, all he saw was conflict and contradiction. So instead of blindly accepting things based on the say-so of somebody who claimed to be divinely uh, inspired or claimed to have divine authority, he decided to figure out things for himself. Now in that respect, he was following in the footsteps of other folks who we've come to call free thinkers, free thinkers who had come before him, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau. These were people who challenged the social and political values of that day. If you read much of Fillmore, you're going to come across Emerson quotes. So if you want to get some idea of where Charles was coming from, it helps to see some of these quotes from Emerson's book that was called Self-Reliance. He said, I am ashamed to think how easily we capitulate to badges and names, to large societies and dead institutions. Or this one, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. And then there's this one. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. Principles, integrity of mind, and not capitulating to claims of authority. Those were the core values expressed by Emerson which deeply influenced Charles Fillmore. Charles was building on the ideas of those who came before him. And of course, they in turn were building on the ideas of those who came before that. I think it's a good thing from time to time to honor and to celebrate our intellectual ancestors so long as we 
don't put them on a pedestal and turn them or their ideas into idols to be worshipped. Sir Isaac Newton once said this, he said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. That's a great quote. And there's another one from Sir Isaac, I think, that needs to go along with it. This is something else he said. He said, Plato is my friend, Aristotle is my friend, but my greatest friend is truth. What he's saying is that we don't blindly accept everything that they said. We honor them, but self-reliance means that every generation has to decide which ideas still make sense and are still supported by the evidence. And we can do that, and even if certain ideas and concepts have proven to have run their course, we can still acknowledge their vital role in human development and evolution. They played a part. Now, I don't want to spend time today talking about the ideas that have run their course or didn't pan out. Charles wrote about a number of things that we don't teach anymore because they didn't withstand the test of practical application. That's what Charles was all about, practical application. An idea had to be practical. It had to be tested. It had to be proven to work in the real world. Charles said something in 1918 describing Unity's approach to truth. I didn't get this quote up on the screen, but it's in the handout in your bulletin this morning. This is how Charles described Unity's approach to truth. He said, it is in this respect totally different from the other religious systems of the world because it does not in any respect rest its authority upon revelation. It has no dogmas, nor creeds, nor are its students expected to believe anything which they cannot logically demonstrate to be true. That was a groundbreaking idea, one of those radical ideas that the Fillmores used to help advance their message in the world. It was a radical statement at the time because most religions insisted that if something contradicted scripture or contradicted the pronouncement of an authority, scripture and authority wins. Dogma wins. And you know what we say around here, beware of dogma. <laughs> Beware of the dogma. Scripture and authority would always win despite any evidence to the contrary, which is why it took 350 years for the Catholic Church to officially acknowledge that Galileo was correct when he claimed that the earth moved around the sun. Now when Charles use the word revelation in that quote when he said that unity does not in any respect rest its authority upon revelation. Now he wasn't just talking about the book of revelation that we find in the Bible. The kind of revelation that he was referring to is what happens when a person or a group of persons claim that God or some other supernatural entity gave them special knowledge or special truth. Sometimes we call that a special revelation. So for example, the Book of Mormon was a special revelation given to Joseph Smith. The Quran was a special revelation given to Muhammad. Many books of the Bible, especially of course the Book of Revelation, were written as special revelations directly from God to the author. And it's still going on today. There are many New Age books out there that claim to be special revelations from, I don't know, invisible aliens and supernatural entities given to people who are channeling them to us. That's a special revelation. Now, if every group relies on their own special revelation for truth and knowledge, that's not subject to objective logical demonstration, don't you think that communication between those groups might be a little bit challenging? 
maybe at times even impossible, but at the very least challenging. And I would also say that scientific and technological progress is impossible without free inquiry and open communication. So, the Fillmores were really on to something here. And this is a major part of their enduring legacy to us. This, this message that, uh, this message that uh, we need to prove it, it has to be practical, show me the evidence, things like that. Now, just about a month ago, Karen bought us matching t-shirts. You know that she's my fashion consultant, by the way. I don't, you know, everybody compliments me on the color of my shirt and things like that, and I just have to give credit to her because, you know, to me, beige is a color, but Karen keeps me, uh, keeps me a little more colorful than I would ordinarily be. Well, she found these two matching t-shirts that look like this. Demand evidence and think critically. Fits right in with what Charles was talking about. Students are not expected to believe anything which they cannot logically demonstrate to be true. <clears throat> Demand evidence and think critically. After all, Unity was one of the first groups to be part of what has come to be known as the New Thought Movement. You've heard of that term, the New Thought Movement? That was another radical idea. It was based on this, this, this notion that our thinking plays a major experience in our a major role in our experience of reality. So the term new thought, it's become uh, subject to a lot of misunderstanding in the recent years, and I have to blame the book The Secret and the Law of Attraction for confusing things. Because after The Secret, people were going around talking about how well they're they're creating their own personal reality. They're creating their own reality. I cannot create a reality that is not subject to the law of gravity. I cannot create a reality that is not subject to the arrow of time. Omelets do not turn back into eggs, no matter how much I think or feel that they can. In the real world, the laws of physics rule. Positive does not attract positive, right? Actually, positive will repel positive. It's opposites that attract. That's how magnetism works. Now, what I can reliably create is my experience of reality. Sometimes, gravity and the arrow of time can get us down, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Wrinkles and age gravity, and time. It's all easier to deal with if we do the work that it takes to change the way that we think about those things. There's a paragraph from an article that I found not too long ago talking about new thought that I think really sums it up, sums it up rather nicely. Another aspect to what Charles was talking about before. It's important to demand evidence and think critically, and then we add another layer to it, which goes like this. New thought is about shepherding your thoughts so they don't run wild despite appearances. You may have every human reason for feeling negative, but new thought asks you to make the outrageous choice to line up thoughts that make you feel positive anyway. Feel the fear, do it anyway. Acting can make you feel better, but before you will change your acting, your thinking will have to change at least a little bit. Change your thoughts and the feelings will follow. So new thought is really a discernment process. And one of the things we have to start doing is to discern between the things that are more or less within our control, the things that are beyond our control, and the things that are maybe sort of in our control some of the time. That's where we're going to pick up again next week with Unity Evolving. Hope to see you then.